outstanding this morning, Marcello. Outstanding. <laughs> you feel the Holy Spirit this morning? Amen. Oh my gosh. Mm. You know, there's so many different songs out there nowadays that you can choose. And I just feel like, you know, ever since we got here, I only wanted to choose songs for our song list that are just straight to God, you know. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Just all just focused on him. And I'm, doesn't he just, he manifests when you just focus on him. I, I, I trust that you felt and still can sense the spirit of God here. Um, so, and a couple of other things, just, you know, we are in the business of making disciples. I think that this... You know, there's no secret about it. Jesus said, go make disciples. You know, it's pretty simple. Just go do that. What's that mean? Make many means for Jesus. You know, like we're all just like him. We, he wants us to be like him. So it doesn't stop the day you get saved. You know, I, like 18 months ago, I, I told you about the Engels scale. Joseph Engels came up with, you know, he said, everyone's on this scale from negative eight to positive eight. Negative eight represents somebody who has absolutely no awareness of God whatsoever. And positive eight is somebody who is a disciple maker, like Jesus. Day zero, like in the middle there, that's the day you get converted. That's the day you become a Christian. But we're, we, we often treat that as the be all and end all. You've reached your goal. Congratulations. You're now a Christian. Just come to church on a Sunday and, uh, and you'll be right. But that is not the goal. And, and when I hear Jackie stand up there and think she's been a Christian for five minutes and, uh, and she, is, she is out there just, just impacting the world and with the love and grace of God, even though, you know, she's still, you know, still working it out herself. Like, she, she, no one told her that you're supposed to be perfect first. <laughs> like, you're supposed to go to Bible college, memorize the entire Bible, <laughs> know it verse by verse. No one told her that. So she's just out there spreading the love and grace of God. How good is that? Amen. And I also wanted to make note that there was a fourth prayer, Dave, that you prayed. And it was here, and it was one of the best prayers of your life when you gave your heart to Christ. Yeah, recently. come on. So, um, again, man, I just bless you, man. Hey, um, speaking of disciples, I am, I can't tell you that I'm disappointed. can't tell you how disappointed I am. Because Franz Hainan went to be with the Lord on Wednesday. And the reason I'm disappointed is because I know that to God, a hundred years is nothing. Like this, he's trillions of years in heaven. But to me, you know, a hundred's a big number. And he was six months off 100. Like, I'm going, come on, friends, just six more months. And he said, don't be on off. I'm out of here. And he went peacefully to be with the Lord. And uh, his daughter Margaret was here, was with him. And, and uh, Dave was with him. And we're going to be having the funeral here tomorrow at four. Uh, we're only allowed to have 100 people. But I reckon, you know, a lot of you will be working. We're not going to get 100 people. So if you'd like to come along tomorrow at four, um, come along. We will have to keep our distances. Um, uh, the, the funeral director said the police are checking funerals. They're counting. They're up the back in funerals counting the numbers of people and you think come on you know we're, we're allowed 250 people in this space by covid laws but if it's a funeral only 100 anyway so tomorrow tomorrow afternoon at four if you'd like to come and uh and you know see him off as it were if you've known him and you've got some stories Franz has been a member of this church for for a long time and uh and i did he was my friend my buddy and um you know we thought we'd lost him last year and he you know, he just bounced back. Remember he snapped his leg in half? Yeah. Like, he's 98 and he snapped his femur in half. And the next day, he's walking <laughs> with, a, with a frame. Like, amateur. You know, but he's walking <laughs> and he comes into church, walking into church. I said, oh, I just strapped it together with some gaffer tape. He'll be right. And he was. He's like, tough old man. And he's just a, he's a good man. So, um, you know pray for that. But I also just want to pray for a couple other um, members of our church. Uh, Shirley Bogle is, is um, really struggling health-wise and no Noel Johnston. I don't know if anybody knows Noel and Lynn yet. Lynn, are you here this morning? No? no. Okay. They've only just started coming to our church, like when we came back from COVID. And, uh, and he discovered that he had a brain lesion. We prayed for him a, uh, about three weeks ago. And uh, it turns out it was more than that. And um, and it's a, it's a cancer, and 
And so I just want to pray for him and for Shirley. God, uh, I have seen you heal people miraculously. I have personally been miraculously healed by of celiac disease. I've seen people healed of other things miraculously, God. And there doesn't seem to be a limit on what you can do. And so we pray for, for Noel in the name of Jesus. And we pray for complete healing. God, that you would touch his brain and that, Lord, you would remove all traces of cancer. God, that you would do a bona fide miracle in him that he would be completely healed. He hasn't reached 70, I don't think. And your word says we get at least that. Uh, and 80 if we're strong, or 99 if we're friends. So in Jesus' name, we pray, God, for healing on him, Lord, for healing, that your Holy Spirit would remove all that cancer in the name of Jesus. And I pray, too, for Shirley, God, that you would take, take all that pain away from her as well, her head, her shoulders, her back, her neck, all the pain. The doctors can't seem to figure it out. We pray in the name of Jesus for complete healing. Amen? Amen. 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 So I appreciate you guys continuing to pray for that. Um, but right now, we're going to get into the Word of God. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Looking forward to it. So a little bit of background. Um, I'm going to talk about Jacob. But Jacob's got a lot... Um, missed. Jacob's got a lot of chapters in the Bible, a lot more than his dad Isaac. So, you know, sort of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Isaac gets like half a chapter and the other two get lots. And so just a little bit of background, um, Isaac, the, the father, so yeah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Isaac had twin sons, Jacob and Esau, but they were far from identical, let me tell you. Uh, they settled in Beersheba, uh, and there was an incident where Jacob manipulated his brother Esau into selling him his birthright for a bowl of soup. And then years later, on his father's deathbed, uh, he deceives his dad into giving him Esau's blessing too. Uh, so Esau threatens to kill him. So he runs away up to uh, in the, the northeast into an area called Paddan Aram. That's about 1,000 kilometers away. He's gone AWOL. And uh, he wanted to, while he was up there, he wanted to marry a certain beautiful girl, but her dad tricked him, which was incidentally his uncle, uh, so this is his cousin he's wanting to marry, but that's a side point, um, <laughs> tricked him into marrying the older daughter first, Leah. You know the story if you've read it. It's in Genesis. So he ends up working for 20 years for this guy and eventually becomes quite wealthy. Meanwhile, Esau has moved directly west into the region of Seir, uh, in the southeast of the Dead Sea. So after 20 years of working for his father-in-law, God tells him, I want you to go back to the promised land, specifically to Bethel, which is where God first revealed himself to Jacob. Uh, and so he ends up going back there and he leaves his shifty father-in-law behind, heads off to, to Canaan. But, but there's a problem. What if Esau hears his back? Ooh, there's trouble brewing. So I want to read to you this passage of Scripture. You're going to love it. It's from Genesis 32. Uh, I'll just skip the long list of animals. <laughs> so I don't have to go through all of that, but needless to say. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'll start in verse 3, uh, and it says, Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you're to say to my lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I've been staying with Laban and have remained there until now. So 20 years. I have cattle and donkeys and sheep and goats, male and female servants. Now I'm sending this message to my Lord that I might find favour in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau, just like you said, and now he is coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. So in great fear and distress, Jacob divides his people who were with him into two groups and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left might escape. So Jacob prayed, O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, who said to me, uh, go back to the country and your relatives and I'll make you prosper. I'm just reminding you, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you've shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed the Jordan, but now I've become two whole camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid that he will come and attack me and also the mothers and their children. But you said, I will surely make you prosper and will make you a de your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. So he spent the night there 
panicking. And from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother. And it goes on to name 550 animals. I counted them. So he's sending gifts. So down in verse 21, it says, So Jacob's gift went on ahead of him, but he himself spent the night in the camp. And this is bizarre. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, two female servants, and his 11 sons, and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok. And after he'd sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. They obviously weren't practicing COVID safe at that point. <laughs> anyway, um, Jacob replied, the man said to him, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked him, what's your name? Jacob, he answered. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome but Jacob said, well, please tell me your name. He replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. So it was no ordinary man. This was God. Whew. Then the sun rose over him as he crossed over Peniel, and he was, in, he was limping because of his hip. Down in verse 33, sorry, chapter 33, verse 1, we'll finish the story. It says, Jacob looked up. And there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and he bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran and met Jacob and embraced him and threw his arms around him, his neck, his, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him and they wept. Wow. So what's in a name? Names are important. You know, names are important. Kaz is a big fan of proper names. Names not only identify who you are, but sometimes what you are. And I'm not just talking about your birth name. Birth names can define you. Think about yourself. If you've got any names that, have, that you've received over your time that have de defined you, the class clown, you know... <laughs> The dummy, the smart one, the leader, the pretty one, you know, have you, have the ugly one, the clumsy one, the loud one. What, you know, there are all these titles, these names that people give you. They can stick you, with you for life if you let them. Kaz has, a, has an auntie, and, um, and she's a beautiful woman. Uh, I met her at our engagement party, and I was introduced to her. This is Auntie Chubby. And I went, oh, hi, interesting name. And she says, could you call me Josephine? And I said, absolutely. Who calls you chubby? Oh, everybody. Because when she was a little girl, she was chubby. And so they called her chubby. And to that day, she must have been over 50 at, the point, at that point, she was still called chubby by all the relatives. And I, I call her Josephine. And she just said, could you please call me Josephine from now on? You know, I mean, what a terrible thing to call somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, even more in Hebrew culture, names were important. You know, when Esau was born, he came out hairy, if you know the, the thing. He had hair all over his little body. And so guess what they called him? Rich. Hairy. hairy. Yeah, the yeah. Grinch. <laughs> they called him Hairy. Like, what parent does that? You know, like, you know, why would you call it? Where's your imagination, people? Why do you name him after his grandfather, Abraham or something? You know, name him something. Like, we'll call him Hairy for the rest of his life. People called him Hairy. That was his name. Like everyone, you know, Jacob, everyone thinks that his name means supplanter or deceiver, right? We all think that's what Jacob means, but actually it doesn't. His name became a Hebrew idiom for deceiver, for a supplanter, because that's what he did. A supplanter is someone who supersedes and replaces. That's his behavior is why that became an idiom. But Jacob actually doesn't mean that. So my question to you today is, I wonder why Jacob became a deceiver in the first place. 
We just read how he, how he um, you know, or I told you how he tricked his brother into selling him his birthright and then tricked his dad into giving him the, the, the better blessing. So here's what, here's what his name means. When he was born, so they were twins. When Jacob was born, he came out of the womb holding on to his twin brother's heel. So they called him Grasps the Heel. So if your name is Jacob or James or Jamie, that's what your name actually means, grasps the heel. But think about it. That's like calling your son a loser. That's like saying, hey, buddy, you're always going to be coming second. You're always going to be grasping the heel of the winner, the one in front of you. You'll always be the bridesmaid, never the bride. You're always going to be behind. You're not as good as your brother. You're the, you're the loser. You're the second. You're not the winner. Look at Genesis 25, verse 27 to 28, if you don't believe me. It says this. As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter and a man of the open country, the Marlborough man. While Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, their dad, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah, their mum, loved Jacob. Can you see what's happening? Esau was dad's favourite. Jacob was mummy's favourite. Esau hunted. He's a man's man. Jacob cooked. So in today's time, Esau would have gone on Ninja Warrior and Jacob would have been in My Kitchen Rules. You know, like, like very different boys, right? Esau was an extrovert. Jacob was an introvert. Esau, he, he had a beard when he was 13 years old, and Jacob still looked like he was 12 when he was actually 25. So, you know, you, you remember those. I, 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 I took, like, 30 years before I could grow any hair on my cheek. That's why I've got one now. You know, I, was, I, was, I had plenty down here. I could grow a moustache when I was 13, but that was it. It was like, ooh, ooh, I'm going to be... I ought to be her suit. And I was all excited when I was 13, you know. And, and you know, when I was naughty, the, the, my friends would send me to, to do, you know, naughty things like, you know, buy a six-pack of beer underage, you know, like, because I looked the oldest, you know. And I'm thinking, any moment now, I'm going to get hair on my cheek. It never came, you know. That's why it's here now. Here to stay. Sorry, guys. <laughs> she doesn't like it. All my kids loved it, so they won. We took a vote. Anyway, so here's Esau. He's a man's man and Jacob's a bit of a wimp, right? You can see that in between the lines. And Jacob's name, Grasps the Heel, was reinforced every day by his father's favoritism of Esau. You're not good enough. You've got to be careful how you speak to your kids. Be careful. Words are a creative force. Book of Proverbs, chapter 18, 21. We all know it. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. What you say of your children, what you say to your children, the way you treat them can affect them for the rest of their lives. So you've got to speak what can be, not just what you can see right now. You know, we, we, we learned this, we did this special course on, it was called Neurolinguistics. And it's basically the power of speaking positive things. And, and our middle daughter, um, she was, um, she's a creative one. She's highly intelligent, unlike the rest of us. Um, it's like, where did you come from? Um, anyway, she was, she was messy. She was always messy. Her room was messy. And we'd learned this, that what you do is, um, is you speak what you, what you see. You speak their potential into them, not what you can see. And so we used to say to her, you're such a tiny girl. You're always tidy, even though she was absolutely chaotic, you know, like her room was just, just stuff everywhere, you know. And we used to, for six weeks, we said, you're such a tidy person. You, this is not like you. you this, this, all this, that's not like you because you're a tidy girl. You're so clean. You don't like mess. You're really clean. You know, we just kept saying that over and over for six weeks, just as an experiment. Let's see if this works. And it did. Six weeks later, call her up for dinner and she didn't come. So we went down to see what she was doing. Room was, just, was spotless to this day. It's still spotless. <laughs> we were down there just, you know, during the week. And it's like everything in its place. It's incredible because she now says, oh, I'm a tidy girl. She was the other one we used to say, truth teller. Truth teller, you're the truth teller. And so at times we'd say, now tell us the truth. Now I'm not going to say you won't get in trouble. You might get in trouble. You might even get a smack. Yes, we used to do that. Well, you might even get a smack, but it's better to tell the truth 
than to lose my trust. And she'd go, mm, okay. And she'd tell us the truth. Oh. We're not going to smack you, you know. But, but and then you thought we were. Aha! So anyway, <laughs> don't take any of my parenting advice. You know, they did turn out okay in the end, thank goodness. But, you know, anyway. So you've got to speak into the potential of people. You know, Romans 4.17 says, God calls that which is not as though it was. He was the first neurolinguistica. And, you know, Gideon, he turns up to Gideon. An angel comes to Gideon. Gideon is packing it. He's the smallest, littlest, puniest guy in a hole, scared, hiding from the Midianites. And this angel turns up. That's the noise that angels make. And he says, Gideon, mighty man of valor. Mighty warrior. Gideon's looking around. Who, me? <laughs> yes, you. That's what I see. Don't worry about what other people see. This is what I see. And that's all that counts because I'm God and I get to do what I want. <laughs> so, you know, that's what God does. He speaks into the potential of people. We all know the famous verse from 1 Samuel chapter 16 where God says, The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Yeah. And he was talking about David, the smallest, the youngest of his brothers. So think about Jacob again. How would his childhood have looked? Well, I, I reckon he was probably teased, possibly bullied, definitely made to feel weak and inferior, if not by his his brother, by his dad for sure, because it says he was dad's favorite. Esau was dad's favorite. But when when Rachel, sorry, when Rebecca was pregnant with the twins, God spoke to her, and she God actually told her the younger twin will rule the older twin. The older one will serve the younger. So she knew that there was this destiny in this thing. So I can imagine her, every time he was teased or bullied and he'd run crying to mummy in the kitchen, she'd say, don't listen to those nasty little boys. You're going to rule them one day, God told me. You know, you can imagine they're just jerks. Just don't, don't you worry, you'll have your day. You know, no wonder, no wonder this guy felt in conflict. No wonder he felt like, man, there's a destiny in me but I cannot see it. I cannot see a possible way of it happening. I can't. God's saying one thing. Mum told me God spoke to her, but that's impossible. It's not even, it couldn't happen. So, so you know, his, his father's words, um, you know, would have had an impact on him, as yours do on your kids. <coughs> you know, we, we need, our kids need to know what God sees about them. Young girls need to know that they are beautiful yeah, and on. special. I used to say to my two daughters, I said, well, I know what you're thinking. I know you think I have to say this because I'm your dad and I'm biased. But, look, that all aside, I'm not biased. I'm just, as a, as a, just a regular person, you two are stunning. You are beautiful. I'm not just saying you're beautiful. And let me tell you this as well. Every single boy at that school would like to go on a date with you. All of them, like all, unless one of them's gay, they're all going to want to go on a date with you. Trust me, <laughs> they do. And some of them are going to have the courage to ask you out on a date. And on that occasion, know this, that we boys might look tough, but we're actually sensitive. So be nice to them when you let them down. So just be, <laughs> say something like, oh, that's so sweet. Thank you so much for asking me out. But I think we should just be friends. You know, something like that. You know, so that you don't want to humiliate the poor guy. It takes a lot of courage to go up to an attractive woman like yourself, you know, or a girl like yourself, and ask them out on a date, you know, or even ask them to dance at the, you know, the formal. And they go, okay, okay, okay. So, you know, all the boys in the school that did have the courage all got let down, but, uh, but at least they felt nice at the end. So, <laughs> but that is not what this message is about. So, <laughs> Jacob, was, it, was Jacob je jealous of his brother Esau? Absolutely. Uh, he wanted to be noticed and accepted by his dad like all boys do. See, girls need to know that they're beautiful. Boys need to know that dad's proud of them. You know, very few boys crave the love of their mother. That's always there. They know mommy loves them. They know that. But they do crave the approval of their dad. And Jacob was no, uh, no different. He really wanted it, but it never came. So he became angry and bitter and jealous. And this, this starts the vicious cycle. The vicious cycle. If you're taking notes, that's the second point. I don't remember the first one, but the second one's a vicious cycle. It's in my notes. So 
And the vicious cycle is this. Negative experiences that you've had, your negative experience creates negative feelings, which create negative behavior, which cause negative experiences for someone else, often your children. Jacob manipulated his brother and his, and his father. He took matters into his own hands because he couldn't see how this could possibly happen. He took advantage of his strong but slightly thick brother and his, his hunger. You know, you read the story in Genesis 25. It goes like this. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished, little one. Rubbed him on the head. And uh, Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, now I'm about to die of starvation, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew, and he ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Interesting. You know, the Bible calls it despising his birthright. His birthright was the double, the, uh, he, he would get twice what, um, what Jacob would get, you know, um, of the inheritance. Um, it's a little bit different to the blessing that he then stole later on from his dad as well. The blessing is, you know, is the, the line, so this is what God's going to say. And he, he did, he, he, he blessed um, Isaac, blessed Jacob, thinking it was Esau, and told him, you will rule nations, you, you know, you're going to be, all your, your siblings will bow down to you, you know, that stuff, sort of stuff, that was meant for Esau, but he stole that from him, so, um, but isn't it interesting that, that uh, bitterness and jealousy and anger and these negative experiences can make you do some pretty ordinary things, can't they? Your negative experiences in your childhood or throughout your life can taint you can twist you and can make you do some pretty bad stuff. Gossip, lying, backstabbing, cheating, whatever it might be. See, Jacob, like I keep saying, he did not trust God to fulfill his promise. He couldn't see any way that it could happen, so he decides to make it happen his own way, which was through trickery. And it's all tragic because God was going to make it happen anyway. We just saw it. You know, Esau despised his birthright, so Jacob would have gone bad anyway. Since Esau despised him, it was, it was unnecessary for him to go to this, these trickery things. Um, anyway, that's why he was named Jacob, because he, he was deceptive. Uh, that, that's, why, sorry, that's why his name, Jacob, became an idiom for deceiver and supplanter. Mm. But now, you know, you know, the Bible says you reap what you sow. So as you go on in the story, and like I said, it's over several chapters in the Bible. As you go on in the story, you see that Jacob... Um, who deceived his brother and his father, now goes up to his uncle Laban, and his uncle Laban cheats him. It's like Jesus said, those who live by the sword die by the sword. Liars get lied to. Cheaters get cheated. You know, it, it's, it, it comes full circle. Now, I'm not saying if somebody's lying to you, it must mean you're a liar. But I'm just making the point that, that there's this vicious cycle that starts to happen. The point is that it all began, listen, with one Thoughtless label. His name. That's what started all of this. A negative name and a father's neglect. And 60 years later, he's still shaping his world by that. Most of us are living lives that are controlled in some way, or to some extent, by past negative experiences. And today, I'm believing that God wants to stop it. Amen. I'm believing that God wants to cut it off. I was praying earlier, and I got that verse in my, in my mind that, where the Bible says that the Word of God is a two-edged sword. It is able to separate soul from spirit. It is able to separate past from future. We serve a God who is more interested in your future than in your past. And He wants, if you've had some of these labels that have affected you for your whole life, Today, he's going to set you free if you let him. Amen. But it might be a bit tough. Yep. See, you might have had controlling parents, so now you overreact to strong leadership. You might have felt humiliated because you're at the bottom of the class, so now you overreact every time you don't know something. Um, you might have been teased of how you look, so now you spend hours getting ready every morning before you go out. 
you know, if you were bullied as a kid, you might struggle with feelings of intimidation, or you might have become a bully yourself. If you've had emotion, if sorry, if you had emotionally absent parents, the fear of rejection might now control your whole life. Or maybe the past has just left you feeling inadequate and a failure, and you've been struggling with that your whole life. One thing is true. The thing that is hindering you from living the amazing, free, and full life that Jesus created for you has got to go. John 10.10 says, Jesus came to give us abundant life. Mm -hmm. He wants you to experience abundant life. He's already paid for it. He now wants you to experience it. So yeah, Jacob had issues, 100%. He had issues. He'd been under his brother's shadow, probably teased and bullied, the butt of weakling jokes for over 40 years. And, uh, you know, his, his bigger, stronger, hairier brother threatened to kill him. So that wasn't fun. Uh, and, you know, and so, you know, his whole relationship was broken down with his brother. Actually, let me just stop there. Have you ever had a relationship that's broken down? Maybe it's not fixed yet. What were the last words spoken? I'm going to believe that God wants to heal relationships too. We all heard, you know, our brother Rick's um, testimony last year. How he, he hadn't talked to his son for 10 years and last year God healed that relationship and it's better than ever now. God can do it. God can do it. Yes, it, it took some stuff. It, he, he had to write a letter to his son and, you know, he, it, was, it was a full-on letter um, and very, very humble. Uh, letter. I helped write it. Actually, I was. You know, <laughs> don't get me to help you write a letter. Put it that way. But no, it, it helped. And, and and you have to do the hard work. But God can set you free. This relationship, you know, like God can heal it. But isn't it interesting that even though he was now successful and wealthy in his own right, he had eleven sons and a daughter, and it's twenty years later, he's still intimidated by that one person from his past. It doesn't go away. How many people don't want to go to a school reunion because of memories and feelings that are brought up because you were bullied at school? I'm not going there, no way. And yet you might be 60 years old now. It's still controlling you. The fear is still there. God wants to set you free. In fact, listen to this. Jacob's self-respect was so low that when his uncle Laban told him to name his price for his work, Jacob just said, I just want to marry your daughter. That's it? That's how much you value? He would have let you marry her anyway. You know, that was a done deal. You didn't have to say that. See, the thought of seeing Esau all these years later brought back those painful memories and with them all the feelings of inadequacy and feelings of, you know, you're a wuss, you're weak, you're no good, you're nothing, you're stupid, you're a loser. All those feelings came crashing back to him. And Jacob had tried avoiding his, the problem. He went a thousand kilometers away to, from his brother, but it didn't make it go away. So here it is, 20 years later, and the same feelings are there. The same fear is controlling him. Now, he could have snuck back into Canaan, obeying God. I'll go back and just hide and, tr- and hope that Esau never finds out I'm here. But he knew something. Jacob knew. Listen to this. Jacob knew that the only way to overcome his past is to confront it. So when I say God wants to set you free, don't think that I'm just going to pray, Dear God, let your word be a double-edged sword. I cut it off in Jesus' name. There you go. How good was that? And you go, oh, that was easy. Fantastic. You know, you just said some weirdo prayer and, and, and I'm good, you know. No, no, no. It might take you a little bit of work. Now listen to this. That night, this is my third point, wrestling for the blessing. Yeah. Here it is. <laughs> That night, Jacob knew, you know how preachers come up with great like, little points? I can never do that. You know? I can... Anyway, that night, Jacob knew he had to face his greatest fear the next day, and he was panicking. So, and I imagine he was probably thinking about running away again. But remember, God had a vested interest in this guy. And God has an invested interest in you too. God has a vested interest in you. He's put things inside of you, and you know it. You know it. God has a future for you. He had a future for Jacob. You know, out of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel came. You know, God had already blessed him, but he wasn't experiencing the fullness of the blessing. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. You know, Jesus said, 
It is for freedom you have been set free. Like he's already paid for your freedom. But sometimes the blessings of God, you know, we need to fully understand what he's saying in order for us to experience them. So yes, we can, we can have the blessings of God paid for, but we're not walking in them yet. We're not experiencing them yet. That's what he was going through. So think about it. How is God going to help Jacob experience the benefits of the blessing that God put on his life? Well, that's simple. I'm going to come to him as a man, and I'm going to pick a fight with him. <laughs> what? What the heck? As if I don't have enough problems. Tomorrow, I will in all likelihood be killed by my big, strong, hairy twin brother who hates me. I took all of his inheritance. Not well, I took his share of the inheritance, and then I took the blessing. He has to serve me now. He is not a fan of Jacob. I'm going to die, and you want to pick a fight with me? This is your. Where's the God of Psalm 23 when I need him? You know, the good shepherd, meek and mild Jesus. Can I have that one? Somebody's going to say, okay. You know, we'll just, we'll figure it out. Somebody who's going to empathize. No, no, God comes and says, come on, I'll have you. It turns <laughs> up and he says, come on, let's go. I'll have you, you know. Like far out. Why does God physically wrestle with Jacob in human form? Well, remember what Jacob's real problem was? His name. Am I told you that? Yeah. His name. It defines him. Grasps the heel. Loser, weak, always behind, tease, bully, <laughs> wimp. So when you call something bad for long enough, you can start to believe it. So in order to remove his own self-perception that he wasn't a man's man and therefore had to revert to deception to win, God shows him the truth about who he says Jacob is. Come on. And he shows him in the most practical way any man can learn this lesson. They're not a wimp. And that is... By fighting. Yes. And when he says wrestling, we're not talking Greco Roman, okay? We're talking <laughs> MMA, you know, we're talking <laughs> Floyd Mayweather versus Conor McGregor. We're talking, you know, off the top rope, <laughs> top pile drivers. <laughs> this is the, in, the, in, fact, in, my, in my imagination, that was how they were wrestling all night. Like, you know, proper movie wrestling, you know, like into it, you know, and just at it, you know. And here he is wrestling, and, and he's not going. Like, even God himself can't put this guy down. We watched this kids' movie the other night on Netflix, and uh, it was called The Sleepover. And, uh, you know, she's in witness protection and has married this guy who's a pastry chef. Anyone seen it? And he's got these, instead of, instead of hand grips, you know, those springy things that give you grip strength, he's got little finger ones. You know, he's, he's just finger ones. Because you said pastry chefs need strong fingers, you know, we need the dough. Anyway, there's this moment where this, the big guy's fighting him, and he's obviously much stronger, and he's hanging on to him with his finger. And the guy's going, Where did you get such strong fingers? You know, like, like, just imagine this, this guy, he's, he's into it, and he just will not let go. Until, until this man, who we know is God, right? This man says, let me go, it's daybreak, you know, I'm going to get back to heaven, they'll notice I'm missing. <laughs> you know, like, like it's choir practice in half an hour, I'm going to go. And, and, and Jacob says, not until you bless me, pal, not until you bless me. You know, you will no longer be called Jacob, he says. Because he asks him, what's your name? Jacob grasps the heel. This is my name. He says, yeah, well, we're going to change that. God's in the habit of changing names. Abram becomes Abraham. Saul becomes Paul. Simon becomes Peter. You know, God, God changes names. And he says, you will no longer be called grasps the heel. Don't like that one. From now on, I'm going to call you Israel. He, he wrestled with God. And he won. <coughs> Right? You no longer be called loser. You are going to be called legend. When you walk down the street, people are going to go, dude, there's that guy. Step back, give him space. He wrestled with God and he won. Respect, Jacob. You're the man. Oh, I want to wrestle with you. Ooh, you know, like you're like a ninja. You're like, man, I, we heard about you. And he says, I don't know, I don't know, it was a big night. <laughs> See, the blessing of God, hear this, is only experienced when you know the truth. 
about who God is, who you are, and what your God-given purpose is. John 8, 31, 32 says, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, because then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. A lot of people say, truth will set you free. No, it won't. No, it won't. The truth will not set you free. Knowing the truth sets you free. Yeah. Believing the truth sets you free. Yeah. Feeling the truth. Embracing the truth. Absolutely encompassing the truth is what sets you free. Don't get me wrong. The blessings have all been paid for, yes. But experiencing them is proportional to your knowledge of the truth. It's like the old ocean liner. You know, like this, this guy gets his tickets on his, on his COVID-free cruise. And, uh, and he turns up with like four suitcases, and he comes in and he's, he goes up the, the ramp. It's this beautiful ship, you know. It's definitely not the Ruby Princess. He's like climbing, <laughs> as he goes into his cabin, and, uh, and you know, the matron D says, oh, welcome, it's fantastic. Is your first cruise? Yes, it's my first cruise. I've been saving a long time for this, you know. I've spent a lot of money on this ticket, you know. Well, well, welcome, it's fantastic to have you on board, you know. Don't forget, there's great entertainment, there's a swimming pool, and oh, yeah, it's fantastic, this is great. Anyway, the, 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 um, the, the staff on board the ship started noticing that this guy, every mealtime, he was missing. He was never there. And they're saying, he must be in that other restaurant. And he goes down looking, no, 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 we can't find him anywhere. Right? And where's that dude? You know, I can't see him ever at meal. So, so a few days pass, like, like about a week passes, and, um, and they finally track him down. They find him at the swimming pool and say, excuse me, sir, um, um, are you enjoying your trip? Uh, yeah, yeah. Is, is anything wrong? No, no, it's fantastic. I've never, never been on anything like this in my life. It's fantastic. I love it. You know, I, the open seas, it's wonderful. And he said, well, you know, we, we can't help but notice that um, you're not in any of the restaurants at mealtime. He says, oh, oh no, no, no. I, I, look, I don't want to make a thing of it, but uh, it's cost me everything I have just to be on this ship. I could not possibly afford the food. I uh, packed, uh, I packed three weeks worth of sandwiches, <laughs> and uh, so I've been eating my Vegemite sandwiches. And they've just gone, what? It's all included. You can eat anything you want. Go upstairs. It's you don't have to pay for it. So many Christians live their lives like that guy where it's all being paid for, it's all available, and they're in their cabin still eating sandwiches. You know, when God's saying it's all being paid for, but you need to experience it, you need to know what has been won for you. You need to know that you, you, God will speak, wants you to have an abundant life. Everything he has paid for is yours. It wasn't free. It's free for you. It wasn't free for him. Incidentally, by the way, who, who is God in human form? If you're ever looking for Jesus in the Old Testament, he's everywhere. Anyway, the Bible says, you know, Jesus came to set people free, and that's what he did. He said, not just from sin, not just from the effects of sin, but also from those negative, powerful mindsets, negative self-esteem, labels, people's negative opinions about you. He came to set you free from all of that. He, God doesn't define you by your past. He is for future for you. And he knows, it says, we know, everyone loves Jeremiah 29. That's the most, most tattooed verse in the Bible. <laughs> I know the plans I have for you, and they're good. I've got good plans for you. You will have to confront your past sooner or later. That's true. And Jesus will wrestle with you until you are free. You will be wrestling interior, interior in, internally. Interiorly. <laughs> You'll be wrestling in internally until you believe the truth about what he says about you. And that will give you the courage to face one of your greatest fears. So if you find yourself wrestling with God, it's because he's trying to help you. It's not, it's, it's not just we just wave a magic wand, say a, say a Pentecostal prayer and loud enough and that'll cut it off and break it. You might have to do some work. Maybe you have to confront something in your past. But what you need to do more than anything is believe what he says about you is true. Yeah. And it can feel hard. It can yeah. feel hard to break that stuff. It's become a habit in your mind. So the next day, Jacob, he still had to confront his greatest fear, but now he's different, see? Now he's Israel. He didn't cower behind the remaining women and children and animals. The Bible says he went ahead of them and he approached Esau with wisdom. You know, uh, just bow down. I mean, dude... I, it turns out I'm like a ninja, but 
I, I don't want to have a fight with you, bro. You know, so he, he's, he bows down to him seven times, dude. It's all good. It's all good. And so he acts with wisdom, but and he may have even been scared, but he was no longer the loser. Now he's courageous. Now he's a new man, yeah. and that is you. You are yeah. a new man. Second Corinthians five seventeen says, "This means, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come." You're a new person. See, the old is gone, the new has come. By the way, it was all in his head. You know, he saw wasn't angry with him after all. He saw, he saw it long since, you know, um, cooled down. It was all good, you know, and he hugged him and kissed him. So, so much of what we fear is actually just in our head, yeah. you know. But here's an interesting postscript. Thanks, Marcello. In fact, I'll get the whole team up. Here's an interesting postscript for you. Jacob had 11 sons and a daughter before he wrestled with God. And then he had one son afterwards. And I want you to notice something. If you read the story when you get home, Jacob didn't make the same mistake his parents made in calling him a loser his whole life. When his 12th son was born, his wife, Rachel, Rebecca, sorry, was, was dying in childbirth. And she wanted to name this little boy Ben-Onai, which means son of my trouble. That's what she wanted to call him, Ben-Onai, son of my trouble. Jacob went, sweetheart, I love you. You're my favorite wife. Um, but ain't no way I'm calling my son, son of my trouble. I've learned a thing or two about names. I'm calling him ben Jamin. Benjamin, which means son of my right arm. God has a name for you. God has a name for you. Courageous, overcomer, lover of people. Strong, wise. He has a name for you. Creative. Something that is he of his character that he's put into you. You're going to influence people in a unique way. And you're going to influence them in a different way. And you're going to influence people in a different way. You're going to help me build a kingdom that's going to cover the whole earth as the water covers the sea. What's it going to be? I wonder what his name for you is. I wonder. Jesus, we thank you that you set us free. Not just so that we can go to heaven when we die. I mean, that's the big one. That's, that's, we thank you for that. That's, that's incredible. But you also set us free from all this nonsense that goes down here. All this negativity and inferiority and fear and anxiety and depression. You, you came to set us free from all of that. You don't call us Jacob anymore. You call us Israel. Yeah. If we're willing to wrestle with you so that you can show us who we really are. God, I pray, I just want you to stand with me today. I pray, God, that even as we stand here, would you start to speak a new name into people? A new name. Those people that know, yeah, look, I've, I've struggled with this one. When I was a kid, you know, they called me the dummy, and I've been struggling with that ever since, you know. I don't think I'm that dumb, but, you know, I can't see that God's got a, a name for you. Confucius. <laughs> wise one Solomon he's got a name for you he's a beautiful you're beautiful you're pretty what's his name for you overcomer maybe it's Peter the rock you are as strong as a rock. The waves will smash up against you, the waves of life, but like Peter, you will not be moved. Your faith is like a flippant rock. What's he calling you?
Grace that flows like a river Washing over me Fount of heaven Love of Christ Overflow in me Thank you Set me free. Thank you, Jesus. Christ, my Savior.
you know, decades ago, every time we relive it, every time we share it, every time we go over it in our minds, we're giving the enemy power. That five minutes turns into one week, turns into one month, can turn into years where we're being robbed over and over and over again. And so I just want to say to you this week, what you water will grow in your life. And I feel that God's going to allow things to happen. He's going to shift the way we respond. Because, you know, when we do something over and over again, it creates ruts. And I say a rut is like a, it's like a coffin with the ends dug out. And we get in these ruts of the way we process things. And I want to challenge you this week as I'm getting challenged. That when those things come and when that self-talk, when that negativity comes, I want you to arrest that moment and just sit with the Lord in that and say, Lord, how can I create a new way of thinking about this? And I'll tell you what, in that moment, there's going to be a shift that's going to happen. Amen. And what you're going to do is you're going to fill in the valleys. And they're going to become flat places to walk on. Yeah, come on. It's going to set you free. Like Pete says, sometimes we're always in for a quick fix. But God's wanting to recalibrate the way we think. Yeah. And so I really encourage you with that. So, Father, I just pray, Holy Spirit, this week, as we may have that self, that inner dialogue that's been there for, for some of us for decades, Lord God, that in that moment, Holy Spirit, that you would arrest our attention. Father, that you would lead us and guide us into all truth that liberates and that sets us free. And Father, that we would start to re recalibrate the way we think, not out of our feeling, but out of our spirit, man. What is your eternal truth towards us, Lord God? And that there would be a shift in power over our lives. The enemy would lose a foothold in us. And Lord, that you would restore us for your glory. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.